Hello and welcome to the V-Ray for SketchUp series. In this episode, we'll take a look at the render settings and how they can affect the quality and render speed. In the previous episode, I showed you how I approach lighting an interior scene from start to finish by only using techniques we've covered so far in the series. Before we start today's tutorial, I want to remind you that you can find the scene we're working on for download in the video description below, together with the scene assets. Grab them for free so you can practice at your own pace. Know that finding the right render settings for your image will not automatically change the way your materials and lighting look like. So if you're struggling to get realistic lighting and shading, check out the tutorial series playlist on the right. Let's start with the render engine of choice. In V-Ray for SketchUp, you can render with both CPU and GPU as well as with the RTX GPU. If you have a good GPU, you can take advantage of that and render with both GPU and CPU for faster results. Down here we have different rendering modes. Right now it's set to interactive, which means that whatever changes I do, for example moving the camera, the render will update my latest position. While we're still in the process of creating our scene, it's best to work in interactive mode, as it gives us greater flexibility when we're making changes to our scene. Now, if we turn the interactive rendering off, we get another option, the progressive rendering. With progressive rendering enabled, our image will gradually get rendered. This is a production rendering mode, which means that we can use it when we're setting our scene for the final render. The other production mode is the buckets. This is the best option for final production renders. If we disable the progressive rendering mode, we will automatically render in buckets. In the bucket mode, we can see these small squares appear on our screen, and based on the quality, our image will be rendered piece by piece. Here we have a very handy tool, the quality slider. Just by moving it, you can adjust the quality of your renders. This eliminates the need of going through each option and assigning the optimal setting for the situation. Each quality upgrade corresponds to different render settings in the quality menu here. If you're still in the production phase, it is always best to keep the quality settings on low and increase the quality to high for final renders. The noise limit here shows the noise levels. Lower numbers will produce less noise. Buckets rendered with NVIDIA GPU devices are always produced with minimum size of 32 pixels. If we switch to progressive, we get another option in its place, and that's the time limit. Here, you can add the amount of time you want the image to progressively get rendered. This option is disabled by default, so you don't have any time constraints. A good use case for this option is if you're rendering an animation sequence and you have to produce it as soon as possible. Then you can calculate the amount of time you have and add a time limit for each frame. The minimum and maximum subdivs control the number of samples necessary to compute each rendered pixel. Minimum subdivs should always be set to 1, as higher values will result in longer render time. For the maximum value, you shouldn't go above 100 for the final render. The shading rate corresponds to the amount of rays that will be used to calculate shading effects like glossiness, reflection and others. Higher values mean that less time is spent on anti-aliasing and more effort is put into the sampling of shading effects. If you're not sure how to properly adjust these options, just use the quality slider I showed you earlier. The anti-aliasing filter is used for softening or sharpening the render image and adds to the render time. This option is very important when you want to render animations, but it's still a very helpful tool when you're working on still shots. Now let's talk about GI, or global elimination. Let's switch it off and do a test render. As you can see, our image suddenly became very dark, except for the areas where there is directional light. That's because when global elimination is turned off, light just hits a surface and disappears. In real life, light bounces off objects countless of times giving even the darkest of spaces some illumination. One good example of GI in real life is color bleeding, which is the result of a saturated object affecting a more neutrally colored object near it. That's what global illumination does. Based on different types of rays, viewer will calculate the light bounces in your scene. We have primary and secondary rays. Here on this diagram you can see how the primary and secondary rays interact. The primary rays are the first rays that bounce off of the geometry. To demonstrate, let's add brute force as our primary rays and add nothing to our secondary. Brute force is the most accurate of the three methods, as it checks the light bounces for every pixel in your image. On the other hand, the irradiance map calculates only certain areas where it thinks light should bounce. And the third option is light cache, which allows you to calculate and store light very effectively. It takes into account different sample areas in order to determine the level of illumination. That's why you see all these little squares everywhere. 
This method is generally used as a secondary array in combination with brute force. You can use the brute force brute force combination for a very accurate result, but the issue here will be that it will take a long time to render. So your best solution for cost effectiveness is to use brute force light cache. When you're ready setting up your quality settings, we're going to head over to the denoiser. As mentioned in an earlier episode, the denoiser is a very handy tool that eliminates any type of grain or noise from your image. There are three different denoisers. I personally use the Intel and Nvidia denoisers while I'm in the production phase, because initial results are faster. For the final image, however, I use the V-Ray denoiser as it gives a more accurate result. Before we click the render button, let's assign a proper resolution from here and add a location where our render image will be saved. In this tutorial, we went through the most important render settings that will improve the quality and speed of your projects. In the next episode, I will show you how you can easily export an animation sequence with V-Ray. Thank you for being part of the V-Ray experience.